Nancy Drew is in Hawaii, which means volcanoes and surfing. There are always volcanoes and surfing when she goes to Hawaii. Just like how whenever she goes to New Orleans, it's always Mardi Gras. Argo Funk Book Review, Argo Funk Book Review. Nancy has been summoned by bank owner Mrs. Faulkner. Her granddaughter Lisa took over $400,000 from a bank deposit box, and nobody has seen her since. Nancy's going to investigate what happened to Lisa three chapters from now. First, we're going to have a detour about Nancy's car. See, when Nancy drives away from the estate, she notices the car has no brakes. For whatever reason, Nancy didn't notice this driving to the estate. Anyway, she almost crashes and she extensively researches the car's history. Turns out that this was an overly complicated murder plot on behalf of the Malahini Corporation. Back to the missing girl, it looks like Lisa ran away from home because both of her parents are horrible people. Mom complains loudly that Lisa picked a really inconvenient time to run away. Now she has to change her weekend plans. Thanks a lot, Lisa! Meanwhile, Dad tries to preemptively arrest Nancy before she can investigate him. Because people in the series often do amazingly suspicious things for no real reason. Lisa tried to sell the things that she stole from the bank, so Nancy goes undercover and meets with a local fence. This was probably the best part of the book, seeing Nancy pretend to be a thief and deal with crooks. She was really good at playing thief. So good, it's almost like she's not even pretending. And when the criminals realize Nancy works with the cops, she does a good job finding her way out of danger. Nancy gets Lisa's address, but she doesn't go there immediately. Instead, like a bad detective, Nancy waits a few hours to give Lisa enough time to escape. Sure enough, by the time Nancy arrives at the apartment, Lisa has completely left and all of the clues were removed by professionals. Well, except one clue, the curtain rod looks weird. Nancy opens it up, inside is a bearer bond and a shipping manifest from the Malahini Corporation. Nancy meets with the three people in charge of the bank and they tell her more about Malahini. It's one of those secretive tax dodging companies set up in the Cayman Islands. Over the past few years, it's become the largest landholder in all of Hawaii, but nobody knows a single employee of the company. Even though it's the largest landholder in all of Hawaii, nobody knows anyone who works there. Recently, Malahini has been aggressively targeting every project the bank is involved in, because Malahini really hates this particular bank. Later on, the bank people get worried about bad publicity. So what do they do? They kidnap Nancy. Somebody knocks her out with chloroform, drags her into the bank, and they say, Nancy, you need to be better behaving. Not exactly the smartest thing to do if you're trying to avoid bad publicity, but still, now I understand why people hate this bank so much. Nancy briefly speaks with a surfer dude who is a witness. He saw Lisa get kidnapped by Malahini thugs this morning. He didn't report the crime to the police, though, because, I don't know, maybe the waves are really awesome or something. A few times throughout this book, a strange person follows Nancy. He is a private eye who was hired to spy on Nancy and her friends. The PI complains he's found everyone except the man named George. Is he Bess's boyfriend or something? George, to her credit, takes the whole thing in stride and makes up a fake backstory for her male counterpart. It's both funny and it solves the mystery, because the culprit is the bank person who freaked out over George's gender. Our culprit runs the Malahini Corporation, and because our culprit isn't all that smart, they hid their secret documents inside somebody else's bank deposit box. So when Lisa robbed the bank, she accidentally stole all the information about Malahini, which is what got the mystery started. Nancy sets a trap for the culprit, but it backfires, the culprit kidnaps her and takes her to Lisa. The culprit's kind of had enough of the mystery at this point, so they decide to kill the girls by pushing them into a volcano from a helicopter. Overly dramatic much, culprit? And yes, I knew this big finale was coming because it is mentioned on the back cover of the book. Spoilers, sheesh. Nancy starts a big struggle in the helicopter, which ends with the pilot getting shot and the culprit falling out of the doorway. 
Nancy falls out too, but she grabs the skids and manages to climb back inside while the helicopter is spiraling out of control. We end with Lisa flying the helicopter to safety. Because Nancy seems to have forgotten she already survived a helicopter crash in Book 14. CONTINUITY! The end. Postbook follow-up. There was a segment in this book that I had to reread multiple times just to understand what was happening. Nancy's car accidentally sets off a radio-controlled explosive at a construction site. Why would a construction site use explosives that can be set off by passing cars using the radio? I don't know. It turns off that the explosive set off because the culprit put a radio transceiver into Nancy's car. Nancy doesn't think this is a murder attempt because there's no way the culprit could know she was going to visit the bank in a bank mystery. Right. But then Nancy also brushes off the other explanation, that the culprit is using the radio transceiver to spy on her. In the end, nothing gets explained and we don't know what was going on with the radio transceiver. Maybe Nancy really was listening to the radio and she's just trying to pass off the blame onto the culprit. Overall, I didn't like this book. The opening kind of soured me with the three chapter detour about Nancy's rental car. That section didn't contribute much to the book, and as a result, everything else got pushed back. For example, Nancy doesn't meet the suspects until chapter 9 of 17. Seems kind of late to wait halfway through the book before introducing the main characters. I don't know, it's not actively bad, but it completely failed to grab my interest. Besides for the part where Nancy pretended to be a criminal, that was amazing. So I give Nancy Drew Files number 23, Sinister Paradise, a 2 out of 10 for the two chapters that I liked.